So last session, we stopped here and uh, this paper was making some nice recommendations to us. Like it's, it's gonna be beneficial if you initialize your word vectors using a pre-trained word vector or word to vec uh, algorithm. It could be word to vec or it could be glove. And at the same time, it's beneficial if you let them train or let them fine tune by your final task. So this paradigm of uh, pre-training fine tuning, we are gonna see that a lot when it comes to natural language processing. And you can think of it as sort of transfer learning. So you are transferring these uh, word representations to a downstream task. In terms of architectures, we started with recursive neural networks. Then uh, we learned about convolutional neural networks. Then we said, is there a way to actually turn paragraph IDs into uh, vectors the same way that you turned in word IDs into vectors? Can we do the same thing? The idea is doable. You can actually do it. But then there is a catch. You have to do some optimization when it comes to inference. And we don't like that. Therefore, we continued with the uh, convolutions and each paper was giving us a new perspective on how convolutional neural networks work. And one of the challenges when it came to sentences but was actually working with variable length sentences. And we learned about, for instance, K-max pulling as one way of dealing with that or, uh, or different types of techniques. For instance, this one is just doing an average pulling at the end and then concatenating those vectors on top of each other so that you end up with a fixed size vector on top of which you can put a, weight, a matrix that you can multiply by your vector, turn your dimension to two classes, and then do your sentiment analysis or classification. Any questions up until this point? We are gonna continue with another way of looking at convolutions in the next paper, but before I move on, I need to make sure that everything was clear so far. Okay, perfect. In that case, let's move on. Most of the models that we saw up until this point were based on word representations or they were word level CNNs or they were word level models. Can you actually work at the character level? And can somebody tell me what are the benefits of doing that in comparison to word level? What are some of the pros and cons of doing it? Okay, there are some answers in the chat. Uh, so let's think of the number of integers that we need to work with in a sequence. Let's say this is your sentence. And if you're working at a character level, then per each location in your sentence, you have only a few number of options. And the fact that you have few number of options, it means that these one hot vectors are gonna be lower dimensional compared to word vectors or uh, word IDs, because you can end up with a lot of words in your corpus. So these are gonna end up being lower dimensional. It's gonna be a sequence of lower dimensional one hot vectors compared to uh, a, a sequence of high dimensional vectors. This is character level versus word level, but uh, there is a downside to it. Your sentences are gonna end up being longer. So this is gonna end up being a very long sentence or a very long sequence compared to when you are using words. So this is gonna end up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so your sequence length. And if you think of it in terms of matrices, for character level, your matrices are gonna be long, but uh, their height is gonna be short. If you work with word level models, you're gonna have a long uh, or a very high y-axis and a short x-axis. So that's the difference. Your sequence length is gonna end up being shorter. So let's move on to temporal convolutions. This is gonna give us another way of thinking about convolutions. Any vector, because we know that a sentence is just gonna give us a vector if you look at only one of the dimensions. Any vector, you can represent it with a function or with a discrete input function. How is that? You can have a function that takes you from a set of integers to the real value. The corresponding vector is gonna be G 
evaluated at the first index, what is the value put it in the first entry? G evaluated at the second integer, what is the value put it in the second entry of your vector? And therefore you can end up with a vector. And then you can go back from a vector, you can write the corresponding function. You're gonna have some kernel and your kernels, you can think of them as vectors or discrete functions. And then once you convolve f by g, you're gonna end up with an output. And all that's changing is the length of your sequence. And this is exactly the type of convolution that we are used to. You want to know the value of h at one of these integers. You are gonna sum over your kernel length, or this is your kernel width of your kernel. So you're multiplying your kernel by your input signal. This d is the stride. So you're gonna look at your input signal every d entry. This c is just for you to take care of the boundary conditions. And this is just an offset. So don't worry too much about it. And then this is just a formula for a convolution that we are used to. So you take a window of your input signal and multiply it by the corresponding kernel, and that's gonna give you an entry of your output. But now everything is one dimensional. What if you have a sequence of vectors? How are you gonna deal with that? In this case, you're gonna end up having many kernels and many weights, you're gonna have many input signals. So what I was showing you here, G, was just one row of your sentence matrix. Now this is gonna give you different rows. This is the first row of your sentence matrix, the second row, the third row, the fourth row. And we know that every sentence is gonna end up being a matrix in the end. These are your input. And then you're gonna end up with another sentence matrix out of the convolution operation and that's gonna be your output. So this is one row, your input, you want to know what is the corresponding output in another row of the output matrix. Now that everything is in terms of matrices, where you had a summation over your convolution or over the width of your convolution, you still have that. It is still the same formula as you have up there, but then you are doing a summation over your input. And this is the full blown convolution. And that's why you can think of it in terms of vector matrix multiplication as well. So there are multiple ways to think about convolutions and this is the exact formula for it, at least 1D convolutions or temporal convolutions. Any questions about the math, about the notation here? Is everything clear? Okay, perfect. Now let's define max pooling operation. For max pooling, if you have an input signal, which is basically a time series, and this is just one row of your sentence matrix for max pooling, you are gonna look at a window of your input signal, and then you are gonna pick the maximum value. So it's very similar to a convolution where the summation is replaced by a maximum operation, and there is no learnable weights. And by the way, in the formula above for a convolution, F is learnable. That's what you're actually learning. Here for max pooling, there is nothing to be learned. And this is exactly what I was saying with character quantization. This is the list of characters that could happen, at least in English. You have your letters, you have some special characters, and this is gonna give you one of 70 or one hot coding. So your vectors are gonna end up being 70 dimensional. And in comparison, where you had word vectors or word embeddings, this was one of the size of your vocabulary coding and the size of your vocabulary was in the order of millions, but there is no free lunch. If this is one of seven coding, then your sentences are gonna end up being much longer. And that's why later on, we are gonna work with subwords, which is somewhere in between the two. Another good thing about character level models is that you are not gonna end up with unknown words because all of these, you know, these are all of the possibilities that could happen. Or if there is something that doesn't happen, you just increase the size of your characters. You include those new characters in your model. And then each sentence is gonna end up being a bunch of sequences of seven dimensional vectors, which you can think of it as a matrix. So this is gonna end up being a matrix that is seven dimensional by L0. And if you have any character that's not showing up in your uh, list, including the black character, like the characters that you have here, you're gonna put an all zero vector corresponding to that. 
So what's going to happen in the end? You have some text, which is, for instance, this sentence above. You are going to quantize it. You are going to quantize the character C. This is going to be one at some location and zero in other locations. This is going to give you a matrix. That's going to be your input matrix. It's most of the time zeros. There is a space here or an unknown character. You're replacing it with all zero vector. And that's going to give you your input matrix. Now you can do your regular convolutions, these operations on top of them. And the role of convolution is to reduce the length. This is what you're doing here and increase the feature size. And another role is that you're going to end up with non-zero or non-binary values after the convolution. Then you do your max pulling, which is basically, again, trying to reduce the length. It doesn't have any new parameters, and then you keep repeating it until the end. So you might be wondering, how do you actually deal with variable length inputs? Uh, for this architecture, you don't. You have a sentence, and then you cut it at some length all the time. And if your sentence is smaller, you're just going to pad it with zeros. And to be honest, most of the time, we are going to be doing this at least during training. Because during training, we want to look at batches of data at the same time, or maybe every 32 uh, sentences, we are going to concatenate them together and then push all of them through our GPUs. And we want to process all of them in parallel. Uh, that, that's why at least during training, we are going to fix L0 and then work with it. And when it comes to testing, you can actually modify this architecture slightly. How would you do that? In the last layer, you are going to put a global average pooling. So you're going to average all of these, and that's going to give you a single vector of the dimension that you like. And then at least during testing, you can work with variable length sentences. So is this clear? We do the same thing for images. When it comes to training, if you have images that have variable sizes, variable resolutions, we are going to cut a portion of that image that is 224 by 224 all the time. We bash them together. We do our training. When it comes to testing, we can then push images of different resolution inside our architecture. And because of the last layer being smartly designed, you can actually work with those images. Because convolution doesn't really depend on the size of your resolution or your sequence length. Here, resolution is the sequence length. It's a one-dimensional signal compared to two-dimensional signals, which are images. Okay, perfect. Some data sets for you to explore. Each one of them are classification. They have different number of classes. They have variable sizes. And you immediately notice there is a discontinuity here. The Yahoo Answers data, Amazon Review Foo, and Amazon Review Polarity, they are orders of magnitude larger than the previous data. And you're going to see why. Why do you actually introduce new data here? Let's look at various models and look at their performance on these data sets. The last three ones are large data, are big data. The first few ones are small data or moderate size. The red color here is the worst model, worst performing model. The blue color is the best one. And then you can see that. And these models at the bottom are convolution based. They are either this model or the models that we covered before. And then you can see that the convolution-based or the deep learning-based models are not the state of the art when it comes to smaller size data. But when you increase the size of your data, these convolution-based models are going to start to win. So for deep learning to work, you need to have large data sets. And the good thing is that for language, you have a lot of data, but there is a catch. Those data are unlabeled. So we need to find a way to work with unlabeled data later on, and we are going to do it. And then you can do transfer learning. So that's the story. You need to have a lot of data. Here is the same message, but visually speaking, let's take the model, this character level convolutional neural network. It's going to give you some results on these data sets. So each column here is where at least the x-axis corresponds to these models or these data sets. So these are different data sets. Your baseline is your CNN. You are comparing it to bag of means. So you take the result of your CNN minus the result of bag of means, divided by the result of bag of means, 
times 100. And that's going to tell you how better your CNN is compared to bag of means on different data. And bag of means was the worst model, and you're actually beating that, which is good. But then you go and change your model. Maybe let's work with n grams TFIDF. And TFIDF here is term frequency inverse document frequency. And the way that you're going to generate TFIDF, there are multiple ways of doing it. You're going to look at your frequency of your words. But then if you look at the frequency of your words, and those be your features, then words like as, such as war for and then of, there, those are going to appear a lot of times in your text. To compensate for that, you are going to divide by the number of times that for is appearing in any text across your corpus. And that's the way that you're going to featureize your text. And then in the end, it's an n-gram model. For instance, if it is one gram, you're looking at your words and then averaging them out. And that's going to give you the, the way that you're going to featureize the sentence. So these are all hand engineered or you're doing feature engineering. Now let's compare it, compare a CNN to a TFIDF. And then you see that TFIDF is actually winning for the smaller size data. And then once you go to bigger size data, your CNN is doing a better job. You can compare to LSTMs. These are also deep models. And it's not clear which one is the winner here. And then we are going to cover LSTMs in the next slide. You can work with word level convolutional neural networks, like the type of CNNs that we covered in the previous slides. And then you can see that actually the character level ones are winning. But then uh, we have to be careful. Uh, there is a cost to your CNNs when you go the character level route. And the cost is the larger your sequence length, the more operations you're going to do. So if you look at only one metric, maybe you can claim that one method is winning. But then if you look at how much time does it take for you to give me this result, then the picture is going to change. And then there are some other techniques. These are all convolution-based. And you can start to see the pattern that for larger data sets, CNNs are doing better. Any questions about this paper before I move on? Was everything clear? Okay, perfect.